Michael Vonnen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and in this video I want to talk about Legolas and Gimli, because you can't really talk about one without talking about the other anyway. So first I'm going to go kind of through their individual characteristics. I'll go Legolas and then Gimli, talk about kind of their background, how they are in the books versus the movies, and then talk about at the end their relationship and how that's a little bit different between the books and the movies. So let's get started. So a little bit as to Legolas's background. Of course, he is the son of the king of the Woodland Elves in Mirkwood. His father's name is Thranduil, which if you've seen the Hobbit movies, you probably picked up on. Um, if you've read the Hobbit, you might know that. And in the Lord of the Rings, there's a slight reference to that. But um, he's around 3,000 years old, so he's you know he's up there even for a for a young elf. So he's he's been around a while. He was actually at the Battle of the Black Gate, if I'm not mistaken, the original one. That might have been just Thranduil, though. Um, but he's basically like most of the Woodland Elves, never really been outside the Woodland Realm a whole lot in his life. His main role in the Lord of the Rings initially is bringing news of Gollum's escape from the Woodland Realm to Elrond, because what happens in the story is after Gandalf and Aragorn actually captured Gollum out in the wild before the events of the Lord of the Rings really get going, he's given to the Woodland Realm for safekeeping, basically, and they unfortunately get into the habit of letting him out uh, into nature to try to kind of rehabilitate him, and he eventually manages to get in touch with some orcs or some other servants of Sauron and sets up an escape. So Legolas is the one who brings this news to the the Council of Elrond. And as I've mentioned in a previous video, and I can't even remember which one, uh, it might have been a video on the Council of Elrond. I'll see if I can find it. But uh, the Council of Elrond is not like it is in the movie set up such that everybody's been invited to this council. Everybody just kind of happens to show up at the same time. So it's kind of by chance that they are all there at the same time. But that's, that's Legolas's role at first. And then he is later selected to accompany the Fellowship as basically a representative of the Elves because they want somebody from each race in the Fellowship. So they have Legolas as an Elf, Gimli as a Dwarf. Aragorn, of course, represents men. Boromir is also along for the ride because he's on his way back to Minas Tirith, which is more or less on the way. And then, of course, you have the Hobbits. And Gandalf, who is none of the above. He's a wizard. not He's an angelic being, not, not, not one of the races of Middle-earth. So... That's essentially Legolas' background role. Now let's talk a little bit about his personality and how that might differ a little bit from his uh, portrayal in the movie. So in terms of personality, Legolas is very much in the movie presented as a very serious, wise, almost almost omniscient, not really omniscient in the sense that we think of God as omniscient, but omniscient in the sense that he knows all the history and he knows all the lore. Okay. Elrond knows all the history and all the lore because he's the he's the lore master of, of the of the era. I mean that that's who he is. Legolas is not really like that in the book. In fact, in the book he's he's more of a humorous character than Gimli is, and I'll kind of get to that in a bit. But Legolas in the book is a much more kind of lighthearted character, as elves are often portrayed as being. Um, and one good example of that is when they're trying to cross the mountain of Caradhras, uh, instead of going under Moria, Legolas, Legolas is really the only one who's not terribly bothered, bothered by the cold. Uh, he's, I'm sure he's uncomfortable, but being an elf, he's a little more hardy and not as susceptible to just the outside elements. So he's kind of making light of it. And he, uh, at one point says, why can't Gandalf just start us a fire? You know, I mean, and he says it in a half joking tone and Gandalf is a little perturbed at this. And he says, why can't elves just go and find the sun later on, whenever they're trying to get back down the mountain, uh, in the movie, they don't really show this, but they have to actually push through a huge wall of snow that fell behind them. And Aragorn and Boromir are basically the ones doing the, the, they're essentially digging their way through. Legolas, being the uh, semi-spiritual being that elves are, manages to just jump on top and run down the top of the snow <laughs> drift. 
and says, I'm going to find the sun, you know, referring back to the earlier conversation. So, I mean, Legolas is actually kind of a, a sort of a joking character in the book, whereas in the movie, he's always serious. The other major difference is the movie, Peter Jackson's movie specifically, I mean, if you've seen the other uh, animated movie, then that's a bit different again, but the ones that most people are familiar with these days are Peter Jackson's movies. If you've seen the movie, then, of course, he's also portrayed as being this super expert warrior who can do impossible things like take down an entire Oliphant by himself, uh, skateboard a shield down a set of stairs. I mean, it's it's kind of insane the things that they have him do in the movies, and that's one of the one of the downfalls of the movies is they go a little bit overboard in terms of the action, and especially in terms of what Legolas can and does do. In the movie, he's a good archer, and he does some good stuff, but he's not otherworldly, preternaturally good at, at combat. I mean, that's that's not... There's only so good you can get at doing certain things, and it's not like he's had ages to practice climbing Oliphants and taking them down. So it's like, how do you get good at that? So that's another kind of difference there. The only other thing I kind of want to mention, as far as Legolas goes, is the fact that his... Um, his role in the story is, interestingly enough, described by Tolkien in some notes that were eventually published in the Unfinished Tales, specifically the section on the Astari. Uh, if you read that section, he actually says something about Legolas being the one who achieved the least of the Nine Walkers, meaning the Fellowship. And it's interesting that he says that, because at one point Legolas actually does shoot down a flying Nazgul uh, when they're on the river, this isn't again. This isn't in the movie, but in the book, and when they're uh, in the boats provided at Lothlorien, going down the river Anduin towards the falls, they actually encounter a flying Nazgul. They don't know what it is at the time, but they they all kind of recognize that there's a Nazgul present because of the the sense of fear that comes with that. And Legolas shoots and manages to hit it in the sky, and it and it falls to the ground. So. It's kind of interesting that he says that that happens, but the, I mean, the way that he says that he achieved the least of all the, the nine walkers is kind of interesting. I wonder if maybe he forgot a little bit, because I mean, if, if anything, I think Gimli may have actually accomplished less than even Legolas, but be that as it may, that was what Tolkien wrote. But it is true of the nine members of the Fellowship, Legolas and Gimli are definitely the least important in terms of accomplishing things in the story. I mean, they're there, and they do some things, but none of them do anything that rises to the level of even what Merry and Pippin do. So, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So now let's talk about Gimli. So Gimli, in terms of his background, he is there with Glowin, his father, who, of course, was one of the original 13 dwarves that Bilbo set out with in The Hobbit. And he's there because the some Nazgul or other servant of Sauron showed up to the gates of Erebor and basically said that Sauron wants this ring and it's not really important, it's just kind of a thing, but, you know, if you can get this ring, which we have a reason to believe was in the possession of one of your traveling companions at some point, then we'll be nice to you and give you your a dwarven ring back, which of course, they, the dwarves know that mm, this is a little fishy, so they send Glowin and Gimli to... Elrond to get advice for this. So that's why they're there. And then, of course, Gimli is chosen as being the younger, fitter dwarf, because Glowin at that point is pretty old, uh, to accompany the Fellowship on its quest. So he's... The interesting thing about Gimli is that his his role in the Fellowship is not really significantly different than Legolas's in the sense that they're both essentially there as representatives of their race, and not necessarily for any other reason. So, you know, some of the other members of the Fellowship, Aragorn is there because he's not only a man, but because he's going to be King of Gondor, and that's going to be a major part of what he does as part of the Fellowship. Similarly with Frodo, of course, he's the ring bearer. Samwise is his servant and goes with him because that's who he is. I mean, there's Lots of people in the Fellowship have specific reasons for going along, other than the fact that they're just representing their race. Gandalf, of course, is going because he's the one who knows everything and has been working the quest and the, the 
working to achieve the downfall of Sauron for a long time, and so he, he's the perfect guide. Um, Merry and Pippin are really the only other two people who don't really go for much of any specific reason. Their only real reason for going is that they're not willing to leave Frodo. So Gimli is kind of in that same boat. He's just kind of, well, you're a dwarf. Here, you can go. So that's Gimli's background. Now let's talk about his personality and his kind of role in the story and how that differs from the books and the movie. So, flip side to Legolas, Gimli in the movie is portrayed as very much the comic relief side of the story, which they had to have some kind of comic relief in there, I guess. Uh, in the book, the comic relief mainly comes from Sam, but you only get that when you're following Frodo's side of the story, and so you don't really get that in any of the Helm's Deep, you don't get it in any of the, there's not a lot of comic relief there. In a novel that works, in a movie, you kind of need something to relieve the tension, but... He's portrayed as kind of the comic relief, whereas in the book, he's actually the more serious of the two between Legolas and Gimli. As I mentioned earlier, Legolas actually has a little bit of humor in the book, whereas Gimli, like most wars, is a very serious, stodgy type of character. I mean, that's not to say that he's always just a brooding whatever. I mean, he's not just thinking about gold hordes all the time, but he is... He is very much a more serious character than he is portrayed in the movies. And, you know, in the, in the movies, he's portrayed as relatively serious, but he gets a little more comedic as time goes on. And I think that's, again, partially because of the dynamic of the movie. You need some kind of comic relief to relieve some of the tension. And after the Fellowship breaks up, the only way that their half of the story gets that is if you add it in somewhere. So the other interesting thing, though, about Gimli's personality and role in the story is his role is not really that significant, much like Legolas's. His most significant, I guess, achievement in, in the story, well, I guess maybe there's two. One is he helps Gandalf navigate the mines of Moria, but then even there it says that Gandalf still always has the last word, so it's not really clear how much he contributes. Tolkien doesn't go into a great amount of detail there. The other thing that Gimli does, and Legolas does this too, but it's more significant for Gimli as a person, when they get to the Paths of the Dead with Aragorn, Gimli's the one who has the hardest time going into it, and that's because he's just deathly afraid of whatever's in there. And he makes us he makes a point in the book and the movie of, you know, why you know, an elf is just going underground willingly and a dwarf is just absolutely terrified. This makes no sense. I'm going to get mocked by by everybody. This doesn't make any sense. So, in one sense, him going into the into the paths of the dead was a pretty significant achievement for him as a person because I mean, he really had to overcome a lot of fear. Um one other thing that I will say about Gimli in the book is that and this is kind of a function of his how they changed him to be the more comedic uh character in the movie. In the book, he actually makes a lot of progress in terms of he he becomes very eloquent in a few places where it's relevant. So, for example, when he tall, tells Legolas about the um, glittering caves of Aglarond, which is at Helm's Deep, it's just a separate part of it, he ends up there, Legolas ends up in the keep. They kind of skip over that in the movie. They don't really get into that. Um, but he's telling Legolas about this, and Legolas is like, wow, I don't care for caves, but even your description moved me. And then, of course, whenever he um, gets his three golden hairs from Galadriel and Lothlorien, there's also, he waxes very eloquent about, you know, he just sounds like a trained courtier at a, at a royal court speaking to a queen. You know, he, he very much gives this idea that he's very passionate about his feelings for Galadriel and and she notices his courtesy and, and points it out. And that's kind of important for the last section because that's a lot of what plays into the relationship between Legolas and Gimli. So let's go ahead and move into that since I'm already kind of diving into it. So the last thing I want to talk about is the relationship between Legolas and Gimli. And of course this is important because these two are, are a pair. They're very much a pair. Um, initially, of course, they don't really start out as a pair in, in the sense that they don't like each other. They're, one's an elf, one's a dwarf. In the movie, that's kind of what it's boiled down to. 
Elves don't like dwarves, dwarves don't like elves, and that's an end of it. Uh, in the book, of course, there's a little more backstory to that. As I mentioned, Gimli is the son of Glowin, who was actually held captive by Legolas's father, Thranduil, in The Hobbit, and therefore Glowin, of course, harbors some animosity towards these particular elves for that particular event in his own history, and Gimli, of course, being the son of Glowin, is going to feel the same way. Legolas, likewise, is not going to be terribly happy about, you know, the dwarves either, so there's more there than just the typical dwarves don't like elves and vice versa going on. So, and but on the other hand, in the book, it's not quite as obvious that they don't like each other at the beginning. It is made a point that they're not keen on being in each other's company, but it's not, it's not played up quite as much as it is in the movie. Of course, what both the book and the movie do in the same way, more or less, is that this relationship starts to change whenever they make it to Lothlorien and Gimli, you know, I, I don't want to say falls in love with, but uh, reaches a point of genuine admiration and respect for Galadriel. And of course, that sets off the chain reaction that Legolas kind of realizes, hey, you're not a hopeless, you know, just dirt bag of a dwarf, you actually have, you know, some real feelings that I can relate to, too. And that, that sets off the change in their relationship. And in the book, it explicitly mentions uh, the fact that they start to spend more time together after that point. In the movie, it's a little more subtle. You can kind of pick up on it uh, that Legolas, and I, this may only be in the extended version, this scene, but the scene where Gimli talks about the three golden hairs that Galadriel gave him, you know, he's asking, Legolas is asking Gimli about that, and then they, he tells the story kind of as a flashback retrospect, as opposed to it showing it actually happen, and you can tell Legolas is kind of having that thought in his head, like, you're not such a bad guy after all. Uh, so there's, that. that's where the relationship starts to change, and after that, they become very, very good friends, so much so that um, when they make it to Helm's Deep, they actually do, in both the book and the movie, have the game of who can kill the most orcs. Uh, and in that sense, they're both a little comedic, if you can call that comedic. Uh, friendly rivalry might be a better term, but they're, they do do that in Helm's Deep. But in the, as I mentioned earlier, they end up separated in the book, which they don't really talk about in the movie. And they're both worried about each other. Well, I mean, you don't really see Gimli's side of it. It's told mostly from the perspective of... Aragorn and, and those with him, and that would be Legolas. Um, and they're worried about Gimli's survival because he and I think Eomer and some men ended up in the caves, whereas the rest of them ended up in the keep. And so they're worried that, you know, Gimli may not make it out. And Aragorn basically says, if he does survive, he's going to pass your count of, of orcs, <laughs> which of course he does. He passes it by one. Um, Although in the movie, for some reason, they got the number off by one. I don't know if that was just a mistake, but it's kind of a random mistake. Anyway, they do have that relationship, and it continues. And so one of the other things that they don't go into in the movie is that as a result of what Gimli saw in the Glittering Caves, and then as a result of what they see in, the, in Fangorn and whatnot, they actually reach an agreement, and I've talked about this before, uh, in a different video, and I'll try to find that one and link it as well. I think it was the one about um, the different mysteries that are unsolved as far as Lord of the Rings goes, because you never really see how this ends up. But they agree that they'll both go to the Glittering Caves, and they'll both go to Fangorn, and so that each can try to learn to appreciate what the other sees in them. Now, you do get a little bit of the Glittering Caves. Legolas actually does go with Gimli right towards the end and he comes out and he says that only Gimli has the words to describe it. You don't see them go to Fangorn and so we don't really know did Gimli get over his <laughs> fear of the creepy forest or not. Uh, and then finally the biggest thing and I know I've mentioned this before in another video but I really don't remember which one uh, but it, at the very end in the appendices it says that it's believed, it's not certain, but it's believed that Legolas builds a ship to go sail into the west, and he is allowed to take Gimli with him. And this is mentioned not only in the um, 
in the appendices, but I think it's also might be mentioned in the Unfinished Tales, or it might just be in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's mentioned somewhere else, but the idea is that because of his devotion to Galadriel and because of his great friendship with Legolas, he is allowed to go into the West, um, which is a really big deal because, I mean, it's usually only four elves. I mean, the only other people we know of that get to go are Frodo and Bilbo, and maybe eventually Samwise. That's another one that's kind of not really clear. Uh, and they only get to go because they're ring bearers, and that's, you know, a pretty big deal. But, you know, Gimli, who didn't bear the ring, he didn't accomplish the great deeds or take the kinds of physical or emotional toll that the ring bearers did, still gets to go just because of his great friendship with two elves, one of them being a very important elf, Galadriel. So it's a very interesting relationship, and you don't, in in both movie and book, you don't really get to see a lot of explicit development, but it's always there kind of in the background, and you can see it happening. So it's an easy, interesting it's an interesting kind of subplot that goes along with the rest of the story that adds a little extra flavor, and it's really fun to watch. And it's more interesting, I think, in the book just because their characters are different and they're a little more nuanced and not quite as <laughs> not quite as one-dimensional as portrayed in the movies. But anyway, that's Legolas and Gimli. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Hope you learned a little bit of information you didn't already know, or at least were reminded of some good stuff from the books that you might have forgotten about. I know every time I read the book again, you know, I'm reminded it just how much is missing from the movie. So uh, anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Please also subscribe and share the video. You can also follow me on Twitter at JRRT Lore. And for the Tolkien Lore channel, I am the Tolkien Geek Namarie.